Amen. Lord, your forgiveness is like grace that runs through our bodies and infuses us with life. Father, we pray that you would meet us here this morning and shower down your grace upon us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Good. On September 6, 2018, uh, Amber Geiger, who was an off-duty Dallas police officer, entered the apartment of a man named Botham Jean and fatally shot him. Geiger said that she had entered the apartment believing that it was her own and then shot Jean because she thought that he was a burglar. Botham Jean was a 26-year-old black man who had graduated from Harding University and at the time that he was killed, he was working as an accountant. Jean was born in St. Lucia and was survived by a number of family members, including a brother. After the murder, the case caught the attention of America uh, because of the tragic nature of the events and the unusual circumstances surrounding it. Because of her error, a man was shot in cold blood in his own house. As the trial was concluding and the sentence was imminent, the brother of Botham Jean asked the judge if he could speak to the woman who had shot his brother. And the judge gave him permission. And what would transpire next uh, serves, at least for me, as one of the best examples I've ever seen of grace in action. So check out this clip from that day in the courtroom. If you truly are sorry, I know. I can speak for myself. I, I forgive you. And I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it. Again, I'm speaking for myself, not even bad for my family. But I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not gonna say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I see I I personally want the best for you. And I, I wasn't gonna ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you because I know that's what that's exactly what both of them would want you to do and the best would be give your life to Christ I'm not gonna say anything else I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do again I love you as a person, and I don't wish anything bad on you. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Please? Yes. Didn't know I was going to hit you with the heavy stuff early, did you? Boy, that's powerful stuff, isn't it? You know, I'm not embarrassed to admit that every time that I've watched that, I get misty-eyed. When I'm alone, 
It might be even a little worse, but that's all right. I mean, what a powerful message of grace, right? Delivered at a time when it was neither deserved nor expected. I mean, everything about this case condemned the officer. She made the mistake. She entered his apartment. She fired her weapon. Justice was his to take. And yet, because of the grace that he had received, he was able to extend the same to his neighbor. I think what we see here is exactly what happens when God extends grace to us. That in the midst of our guilt, when we deserve nothing from God, that he offers it freely, even when it doesn't make sense. This is grace in action. Grab your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. We're going to look at the parable of the unmerciful servant and the concept of grace in action this morning. If you don't have your Bibles, uh, don't worry, it's going to be up on the screen. Uh, but if you have them, turn to Matthew chapter 18. In verse 21, Matthew writes this. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times... Shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Now we're going to stop here for a minute. Before Jesus even gets to his parable, he's uh, confronted by Peter, one of his disciples, who asks him a question about forgiveness. He says, when a brother or sister sins against you, how many times should I forgive them? Now, this might seem like a random question to us, but actually, this was a fairly common question in rabbinical circles in the first century. We actually have evidence of rabbis in the first century debating this very question. How many times should you forgive a a neighbor who sinned against you? And in the first century, the general consensus among rabbis was that you should forgive a person three times before you withhold forgiveness. Which actually, if I'm being honest, feels pretty generous to me, right? If someone offends you or hurts you or abuses you, and you forgive them, and then they do it again, I I think even two times might feel generous to me, let alone three times. And yet the rabbis say, forgive three times, and then the fourth time, the person kind of deserves what they get. In other words, if you were a, a generous and pious person in the first century, you would forgive your neighbor three times. But after that, nobody could blame you for turning your back on the person who's offended you. And so when Peter approaches Jesus, he's engaging him in a a common rabbinical debate of his time. He's sort of bringing up the old adage, you know, fool me once, shame on me. No, shame on you. You know, it's funny, I was thinking of George Bush when I was putting this quote in, and I was making fun of him. And every time I've gone to say it, I've said it wrong. So I can't... (laughs) Can't blame him too much. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And the idea is, if you allow someone to keep hurting you or abusing you, then it's kind of your fault, right? You you kind of own it. And yet, when Peter comes to Jesus, he doesn't just go with the prevailing thought of the teachers of his time. He actually goes beyond. Did you notice how Peter doesn't wait for Jesus' answer? Peter says, how many times should I forgive my neighbor? Seven times? And so based on what we know about how rabbis taught on this subject in the first century, we know that Peter is actually going above and beyond the prevailing thought. In fact, based on Peter's personality, I think Peter's bragging here. I think Peter is, is taking what the rabbis say and he's saying, look at how much more generous I am than the teachers of our time. Peter's trying to show off. He's not as concerned with Jesus' answer as he is with his own answer. And so he says, Jesus, how about seven times? Look at how extreme I am. Look at how generous I am. But Jesus takes what Peter says, and he says, actually, Peter, I have more in mind. See, in the kingdom of God, even seven times isn't enough. So he says, Peter, when your neighbor has sinned against you, you shouldn't just forgive him seven times, but 77 times. If you've read an older translation like the King James Version, you might remember that it says something like 70 times 7. And the reason for this is because in the Greek, the the term that's used here isn't meant to be a literal term. It's not a number where we can print out a a paper with check boxes on it and say, this is your 14th time, you know, you're getting close. What Jesus is saying here is that the forgiveness that we show our neighbors 
should be limitless. That, that there should be nothing that stands in the way of us forgiving those who have sinned against us. Now, if you're wondering where Jesus came up with this number, it's kind of a strange number. So it should cause us to stop and think, where did Jesus come up with 77 or, or 70 times 7? And I don't think it's random. I, I think Jesus is actually quoting a passage from Genesis and reinterpreting it. In Genesis chapter 4, just four chapters into Scripture, when sin is taking over the earth, when sin is like a disease corrupting all of God's creation, we read the story of a man named Lamech, who's a descendant of Cain. And in Genesis chapter 4, verse 23, Lamech tells his wives this, Ada and Zillah, listen to me. Wives of Lamech, hear my words. I've killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. In other words, what he's saying is, I've been offended, and what I have a right to pay my neighbor back is 77 times what was given to me. In other words, justice is heavy when it's delivered to those who have sinned against me. I have a right to pay them back eye for eye and tooth for tooth times 77. And so we have this exact same phrase used in Genesis to talk about retribution and justice used by Jesus to talk about forgiveness. Jesus takes it and applies it to the limitless forgiveness available to everyone who follows him. In the moment, Peter is demonstrating the generous nature of his love, but Jesus takes it a step further and challenges Peter to understand that with forgiveness, it's like a well that's constantly being refilled. You know, a good well constantly fills back up again, right? You, you drink the water from it and the water comes pouring back in. It, it's this endless supply. And not only is it endless, but it's the antidote to retribution. See, what Jesus is saying is that in the kingdom of God, that forgiveness needs to be doled out instead of retribution. That retribution belongs to God alone. See, the playing field is leveled at the moment that God's grace is made available. To elaborate, Jesus goes on to, to then tell the parable of the unmerciful servant. In verse 23, Jesus explains this. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man with 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants and owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And his fellow servants fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison, until he could repay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servants in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister in your heart. When I finished reading this parable in the first service, there was sort of an audible like, <gasps> when we finished, like, boy, this is a hard teaching, right? In the, in the parables, Jesus sometimes teaches hard teachings, things that are hard to swallow. And the Gospels actually say that people leave him when he teaches like this. That there are crowds and, and some of the people go home, they, they can't handle this hard teaching. And here's Jesus. He says, this is how my heavenly Father will treat you if you don't forgive your neighbors. Anytime that Jesus says, 
this is how the kingdom of God is, or this is how my father is, or this is how things work. We better pay attention, right? Jesus is speaking directly to how his creation works and how the kingdom of God operates within it. And so right away, we're introduced to three important characters. We're introduced to a king and two servants. The parable begins with the king who has decided to collect his debts. Given some of the nature of his story, this is likely a Gentile king who is ready to collect the debts or taxes from the people who live in his kingdom. When the time has come, the king is ready to settle his accounts. Now, before we go any further, I think it's important to stop here and appreciate what Jesus is saying, because I think a lot of times we want to jump right to the forgiveness, but then we miss something really important about how the kingdom of God works. And that's this, that the king is owed money and he's calling his debts in to be paid. This isn't a popular topic anymore, right? This is kind of like the thing our grandparents talked about when they wanted to scare us into behaving. We don't like to talk about the idea that we owe God a debt and that that debt will have to be paid, but scripture is clear that every single one of us will stand before our creator one day and have to give account for the debts that we owe him. Jesus is trying to make a point that there will come a time in every one of our lives when God will settle his accounts. There's no escaping it. There's no talking our way out of it. This isn't going to be a more depressing uh, version of let's make a deal, right? We have debts on the books that have to be paid. It's not because God doesn't love us, but it's because although God is a God of love, he is also a God of justice, which means that he can't abide debt. That when sin is, uh, sin is accounted for, that a debt is on the books and that somebody has to pay for it. And that at the end of time, when all of creation is restored, the scales will be balanced. Now, as Christians, we believe that that debt is paid for Jesus on the cross. We believe that when we stand before our creator in the end times, that our debt will be paid by the man standing next to us who went to the cross on our behalf. What we also believe is that if you don't accept the free gift of God's grace, that you will pay for your debts. That every debt will be paid, that not a single debt will be missed. Somebody will pay for them. And God in his great love wants to pay for us. Our debts will be settled and nothing will be unpaid. As the story continues, the man comes before the king with this impossible debt to pay. Now, some scholars have tried to put this into financial terms. Some people say that it's in the millions. Some scholars even try to go as far as the billions, but I think they're missing the point because Jesus isn't trying to set a, a financial numerical number on it. What Jesus is trying to do is say that the debt was an impossible sum that could never be paid. What's interesting is in the first century, uh, there were two forms of measurement when it came to money. The largest way to measure money was in bags of gold. Gold was worth so much that if you owed a large sum of money, you would measure it in how many bags of gold it came out to be. The largest number that they used in the Greek language was 10,000. In other words, Jesus takes the, the two largest ways to measure money and he combines them. The man owed 10,000 bags of gold. In other words, it, it was like the GDP of a medium-sized nation, okay? This man owed an enormous sum of money, and therefore his debt could never be paid. We don't know what got him into this situation. Maybe he took that money and spent it on wild living. Maybe he, he thought he could invest the money and collect the profit and then pay back the principal. Whatever it was, he took the king's money and he used it for his own purposes, on top of that, he was using money that didn't belong to him in the first place, right? This was money collected from taxpayers and that was meant for the king, and this money used it for his own purposes. Whatever he did, in the end, there was nothing left. And the response of the king was not only to hold him accountable, but his family as well. And I think it's interesting that his family is held accountable too. And I don't know what Jesus is trying to say here, but... I wonder if it has something to do with the nature of sin. Sin doesn't just affect us personally, does it? 
any one of us who's grown up in, in a home where there's addiction or, or cycles of abuse, you see how the sin uh, not only corrupts the person who's doing the sin or performing the sin, but the people around them too. And so here's this man. He's collected this enormous debt. And not only is he responsible for it, but his family's going to suffer as well. But after the judgment is pronounced, the man comes before the king and begs for mercy. And despite the impossible sum of money, the king forgives him. Millions upon millions upon millions of dollars are forgiven and the king lets the man go. Now you would imagine uh, that in this moment, this man should be grateful, right? I mean, this man should, should spend the rest of his life changed forever. And how would you feel in that moment? Maybe you've dealt with a serious sum of debt before. You know the pressure that comes along with that. The vast majority of Americans are drowning in debt. We've talked about this before. In 2023, uh, the average American carried about $22,000 in debt, apart from things like their mortgage or car payment. In order to, to reduce their debt, the average American dedicated about 30% of their monthly income just to paying off debt. I mean, think about that for a minute. I've had times in my life where I've struggled under debt and I felt the pressure that comes along with having debt. And I could have only imagined in that moment if someone had come to me and said, you know what, Thomas, here's a check. I'm gonna pay off your debt for you so you don't have to stress anymore. I mean, I would like to think I would be a very grateful person that my life would be changed. Unfortunately, the man has his debt forgiven and he learns nothing from it. He, he leaves the king's palace and he's exactly the same man before that he is now. Not long after his debt is forgiven, this same servant comes across another servant that owes him money. And it's a much smaller sum of money. We have the, the man who's forgiven uh, you know, millions and millions of dollars and this man owes him something in the nature of about a, a couple of thousands of dollars far less than he owed, and yet when he sees the man, he chokes him, and he says, pay me my money. And when the man repeats virtually the exact same statement that he said to the king, the man shows him no mercy. And in response to his outstanding debt, the first servant has the second servant thrown into debtor's prison, which was actually a far worse outcome than what would have come to him from the king. See, although you were beholden to someone in the first century, a slave in the ancient world still had rights. A slave could own property. A slave could actually get an education. They could own businesses. In the first century, slavery wasn't a lifelong sentence. Slavery was generally used to pay off debts. Most of the time that a servant served in the first century, it was to pay off a debt that they owed. Therefore, the, the first family's man, he, or the first servant, I mean, could have worked off his debt to the king. His family could have worked to pay down his debt. There was light at the end of the tunnel. In the case of the second servant, however, he's thrown into debtor's prison. And debtor's prison was a little bit of a, a contradiction because the whole idea of debtor's prison was you were in prison until you could pay off your debt. But you can't pay off your debt while you're in prison. And so even for small fines, 20, 30, 40, 50 dollars, you could have spent the rest of your life in prison because unless you had somebody from the outside come and pay off your debt, you had no way to pay it off. And so the first servant is not only showing no mercy for the debt, but he's doing something ruthless. He's sending him into prison, a place where he might spend the rest of his life suffering for this relatively small sum of money that he's owed. When their fellow servants hear the news, they're furious. And Jesus went on to say that they went back to the king and told him what had happened. In response, Matthew writes, then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In his anger, the master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. In a heartbeat, the king's judgment is reversed because of the way that the servant treated his neighbor. His neighbor 
I mean, doesn't this seem harsh? And isn't this a tough pill to swallow? You know, I wish I could tell you otherwise. I wish I could sugarcoat this passage to make it more palatable. I wish there was some way to spin it, spin it so it didn't feel as harsh. But, but I don't think there is. You know, I, I was wrestling with this passage this week, trying to figure out a nicer way to say it. You know, trying to figure out how to give you uh, your medicine with a spoonful of sugar. But I just couldn't figure out a way to do it. So I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. This parable seems to be saying this, that there will come a time in our lives where every single one of us, every man, woman, and child will stand before the king and have to settle their accounts. And if we can't figure out how to forgive our neighbors in this life, then we can't expect to experience forgiveness in the next. Let me say that again. If we can't figure out a way to forgive our neighbors in this life, then we can't expect to receive forgiveness in the next. That's what this parable seems to be saying. I don't know how that works or how it will be measured, but according to this parable, they'll be connected. And in a lot of ways, I'm uncomfortable with this fact, right? I mean, because I, I, I think about all the times that I've withheld forgiveness from the people that have wronged me. I think about all the times where I didn't show grace when I should have showed grace. And yet here it is challenging me to consider how I've conducted myself with those who have wronged me. You know, although it seems hard and harsh, I can't shake the feeling that Jesus doesn't expect us to figure this out easily. This is not a, an easy truth. This is a hard truth. It's a truth that might take a lifetime of discipleship and following Jesus to master it. It's not something that, that we learn on day one. Somehow, some way, the grace that we receive is directly connected to the grace that we give away. And that should force us to stop in our tracks and, and think very carefully about the way that we've dispensed grace to those who've wronged us. Although this teaching is certainly a hard one, it really shouldn't surprise us if we know our Bibles. Actually, we kind of see this all throughout Scripture, especially in the New Testament. In Colossians 3, verse 13, Paul writes, Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Jesus teaches in Mark eleven twenty five, 25, And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. Forgive them so that God can forgive your sins. In Luke chapter 6, verse 37, Jesus declares, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. In Matthew 6, 14, and 15, and pay attention, because this is a good one, all right? Jesus says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. I need to find a place to hide, right? That's how I feel very exposed right now. Jesus says this clearly, right? Jesus says, if you don't forgive your neighbor, your heavenly father will not forgive your sins. I mean, that should put us directly in the spotlight, right? I'm on the stage, but the spotlight is facing all of us. It can't get much clearer. If we want to participate in God's divine grace, we must be willing to share God's grace. The band's going to come forward now, and as they do, let me leave you with this. I was trying to think of a way to describe this concept, and I came up with an illustration that I, I think captures it perfectly. You know, when I was in college, uh, I was a lifeguard, and so a part of the process of becoming a lifeguard is you have to learn CPR. We've all seen this before, right? They put the big rubber dummy in front of you and you have to tilt their head and pinch their nose and pull down their chin and breathe into their mouth. And the purpose of this process is to breathe for someone who can't breathe. In other words, you provide the oxygen so that they can live. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, you know that grace is like oxygen. 
that we can't survive without God's good grace and forgiveness in our lives. It's absolutely essential to life. Now, I want you to imagine that, that I'm a new Christian and, and I've heard about this thing called grace. I've decided I want it and I take a big, deep breath of it. And I think, ooh, that's good. That's some good grace, right? And I feel alive. And then there's this person who's wronged me. And they're standing right in front of me and they're dying from their sin. And I'm like this. This is good, right? And I go, I'm sorry you don't deserve it. I'm sorry, I know that you're dying in front of me, that you desperately need this oxygen, but I need it too. I'm keeping this to myself. You know, in that moment, it, it might feel like you're taking care of yourself and, and they're responsible for their actions. But what we don't seem to get is that when we do that, there's actually two things happening. That when we draw that breath in and we keep it to ourselves, not only do we kill the person in front of us, but we kill ourselves too. See, when we hold that breath in, the oxygen is going to run out at some point. See, that's not the way oxygen was meant to, to work. See, in the, in the same way that we breathe oxygen in and, and are called to let it out, forgiveness, this grace that God offers, wasn't meant to be held in. It was meant to flow through us into the lives of people around us. Can you imagine if someone went walking around afraid to breathe because they were worried about using up all the air? You know, sometimes we forgive as if we've got a limited resource. You know, this person deserves it. This person doesn't. I better keep it because I'm running out. And God says, no, the well of my forgiveness is deep and full of life. Give it freely. You'll never run out. And actually, the paradox of God's love is that the more we give it away, the more full we become. That God's grace grows deeper and deeper and deeper inside of us the more we give it away. Christians should give away grace and forgiveness like there's an endless supply of it. Take deep breaths of it. Let it fill your lungs and then pass it along generously. Because if you hold on to it too tightly, it'll end up killing you. Don't hold your neighbor's sins against them. Let them breathe in the pure oxygen of God's grace, even if they don't really deserve it. Because we didn't deserve it either. I mean, this is what we're called to do. And the only way that we can do it is by the power of God's grace given to us through the relationships we have with Jesus. You know, when I watched this video of Botham Jean's brother, my first reaction was to think, how could he do this? I mean, what, a, what an extreme example of God's grace. I could never do that. The, the, I, I would be in that courtroom like begging for the death penalty. That would be me, right? I mean, I, I hope it wouldn't, but it would be hard to show grace to someone who's done such a terrible thing to someone I love. And then it became clear as I was watching this video that it wasn't his strength. It wasn't something he did. It was God's grace flowing through him. It was this supernatural divine moment where God's grace, his unlimited well of love becomes available to his worst enemy, not by his strength, but the, by the strength of God flowing through him. Jesus was the one who gave him strength to forgive that woman. Jesus was the one who breathed life into him. I mean, here before us stood the antithesis of the unmerciful servant, the one who had been forgiven much and forgave much. And because of that, he will be accepted into the kingdom of God according to Jesus Christ. Instead of watching her die, he breathed life into her, God's grace into her lungs. And because of that, he modeled the life that Jesus is speaking about in this parable. I mean, this is active, active grace. This is the type of life that Jesus was talking about. Grace in action, bringing life to the dead. I mean, if we can get that, then the whole world will be changed around us. So go out this week, breathe God's grace in deeply and enjoy the, the sweet grace of God as it fills your lungs and then give it away as generously as you received. For there's no shortage of grace in the kingdom of God and we all desperately need it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, uh, give us this grace that we need. Give it to us in abundance. Fill us up, Lord, so that we might become sources of life to the world around us.
Remind us, Lord, that the grace we received was not earned, it wasn't deserved, but it was given freely because of your great love. And help us to do the same. In Christ's name.